It's good to hand over to Brian to deliver his talk. Hi. So while they figure out how to transition to my laptop from their PC, I'll mention that Northwestern University, where I work, is in Chicago, Illinois, um, not in the Pacific Northwest. And the reason for that is when we founded the university, the United States was quite a bit smaller than it is today. And Chicago was, in fact, in the Northwest of the United States. Things changed. Um, OK. So what am I going to talk to you about? I'm going to talk to you about how I think about intelligent production tools and also some examples. Now, what I'm showing you on the screen right now is not how I think about audio production, but it is how Google thinks about audio production. Just to start this out, I decided to uh, go onto Google and go to Google image search and ask the question, hey, what is a music producer? And this was the top hit. So I just want you to look at that for a moment. And so there's obviously a dude with a beard here. And <laughs> what looks like it might be a Pro Tools session, lots and lots of wires and sliders and knobs. And in the background, there's a small head there, which we might think is the musician, uh, who you can imagine saying, I, could you bring up the f clarinet? Uh, and, and so this is the top image for a music producer. Now, now that you've seen that, I'm going to show you the top image from musician. First of all, just take a moment and imagine it for yourself, what, what you might think it is and what you think Google might say it is. OK, here we go. <laughs> that is our number one image for musician, at least. Uh, this weekend when I put together the talk. So uh, you can see here, he's got the ripped jeans, the, the, the leather jacket, and he's got a guitar and, and a story to tell. And so as far as what the world sort of envisions as a producer and what the world thinks as a musician, these are two canonical images. Now, I want to take a moment and think about because many people here in this room, you are both, right? So I know some of you are excellent guitar players, just like that guy. Francois, did, is, do, you, do you identify with this? Uh, excellent guitar players, excellent musicians of all sorts. And you're also probably pretty good at music production, or you wouldn't be in this room right now. OK? So. Before you start to object to some of the things I'm about to say, saying, you know, hey, I have an electrical engineering degree and am an amazing, you know, jazz trumpet player like Guy Richard, I, I want you to remember that not everyone is as multifaceted as everybody in this room. And there are different skill sets, different mindsets, and people who are interested in different parts of the process. And one thing that we have to be careful about when we're making tools is it's great to start with yourself as the user, but there may be opportunities to do stuff to empower people who are not yourself. And there is some place in between fully automating and I'm the one in the back of the panel rewiring how the patch bay goes together. OK. So I'm going to mention a couple of people here. This is, this is an actual local. Uh, London guitarist, and if you haven't heard Matt Bacon, you really should. He's he's really good. Um, and I had the th this weekend. I was hanging out with with a couple of people in the band Shikoya, which is a local band, and they were playing tracks for me off their album and talking about the process that they were going through as musicians, as specifically as acoustic musicians. And you know, in the discussion about whether the the bass and the drums were too present, Matt gave me this quote, um, which I thought might be apropos for a lot of the technology that people like Josh is coming up with. If you, know, you, if you have a, a crowd which they really care about music, but they really wish someone else would take care of the mixing, Matt is the perfect person for, for the perfect exemplar of that crowd and, and how you would want to fully automate a process, even though he's an excellent musician with great ears. 
Christina, on the other hand, also in the band Shikoya. Sorry, I just stepped on my shoelace. Ah, there we go. She wants to be more involved in the mixing process and was very interested in her sound. And when she was talking about uh, A being a couple of mixes, she said some key stuff. I like this. It sounds more present, in your face, more chunky. And me being the engineer slash musician that I am, I said, ah, so what do you think it needs? Or what do you think changed to make it that way? And she said, I don't know. But she could A, B, two things, listen to them, give evaluative feedback, and also give these words. She didn't say things like, oh, you know, we added a bit of compression to, to you know, reduce the dynamic range and make it more present. She didn't say, I carved out some portion of the spectrum with the EQ and the guitar so that the vocals started to pop. She doesn't know any of that stuff. She knows what she likes. She knows how to describe it in language. OK. Probably everyone in the room recognizes this. This is Pro Tools. And do you remember that image that I showed you of the producer? The, this is what might be on the producer's screen at some point. And also, what's on that screen has certain things about it which I want to talk to you about. Here's another very commonly used program. It's called Reason. By the way, is there anyone in this room who hasn't seen either Pro Tools or Reason? Yeah, OK. So you might recognize this then. Now I come back to this. We've got our canonical examples. Who were these tools built for? The, the guy with the leather jacket and the song in his heart? Or the guy at the mixing board? And I think you guys know the answer. Now I want to start thinking about what ideals this embodies. This is reason. This is a rack of studio gear. This is a photo. This is a screenshot. Obviously, reason, in large part, the interface for reason was designed to emulate as closely as possible racks of gear. And for those of you who have played with reason, you know that you can Look at the back, right? How, how many of you who have used Reason have looked at the back of the rack, right? And just for fun, you unplug one of the cables, right? And you let go. And somebody took the effort to put in a physics model so that the cable swings like this, right? Think about the amount of programmer effort and thought had to go into making the cable swing just like a real cable. And now I'm going to start asking the question, why did they spend so much time on that as opposed to spending time thinking about how to make an easy to use interface? Because of course, as we all know, patch bays are painful to use, right? We've all been in that situation where you're like, okay, I've got a microphone here, I've got a patch bay here, I've got the effects box there, and now um, 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 I've actually, I actually was in a recording session where we had to pack it up and go home for the day because somebody in the studio the night before had gone through and messed with the patch bay and the recording engineer couldn't figure out how to route sound back to my headphones so I could listen to the track while I played uh, an overdub. So we literally had to just scuttle the session and start the next day when the other guy who knew what he had done could come in and fix the patch bay. Ridiculous as that sounds. So reason and things like it, if you think back to before when many of you were born, say it's the 80s or the early 90s, um, all of this software cost tens or twenties of thousands of dollars. And so the only audience that you had were going to be people who already knew how to work all the analog equipment that existed before. And so you wanted to make the barrier to entry for them as low as possible, because if they have to change their process to use your stuff, they won't do it. 
So you make all your software look as close as possible and act as close as possible to the hardware, the analog hardware that existed before, right down to, you get to this, the look of the knobs. So the ideal that's embodied in a lot of this software, this sort of unconscious ideal that, that happened, was make it just like what existed before. Now some of you are gonna say, hey, We've moved on from that, but if you actually take a look at people who give up skeuomorphism, they still show you the knobs and control your reverberator in terms of things like time to first echo and just a bunch of stuff. Or, or you know, they'll talk about Q, try and explain to an acoustic musician what Q is. It's the underlying ideal that we still haven't really gotten away from is make it just like the 1970s analog hardware that existed before. And that's great, but that misses an opportunity. And what's wrong with that? So, okay, let's say I have a task. was playing for a while with a trad jazz band, and uh, that's me on clarinet. And, but we wanted it to sound like it was recorded like this. As opposed to What's that? Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here, the old effect where it's like, oh, it's like it's on a little transistor radio, and then, oh, it suddenly becomes big and stereo. Great, so I want it to sound tinny. So I go to Pro Tools. <laughs> and my first question is, where's the tinny knob? Backing off from that, my next question might be, is there anything that could achieve tinny on the screen right now? And since many of you are experienced with Pro Tools, you can probably tell there is something on the screen right now that could achieve tinny, but I'll just show it to you. This 21 knob thing with, with some sort of, I don't know what that graph is about if I'm an acoustic musician, but it's certainly pretty. Now. Because many of you are electrical engineers or computer scientists, I want you to imagine the following. Let's say each of these dials can take 10 positions, okay? There are 21 dials. That gives us 10 to the 21 combinations. Now, you are a neophyte who's just gone out and bought Logic or Pro Tools or any of these things you might be a really good musician. You want to change the EQ to make it tinny. Wow. Now, obviously, there's other choices. You could use a graphic EQ. There's, there's different things you could do. But, wow. OK, this is modern software right here. So what's going on? Well, what's going on, or at least I think what's going on, is that there are different spaces in play. There's the conceptual space where I might say something like, I want the music to sound angry or warm. There's the perceptual space, what you can actually hear. Hopefully this is clear, she's listening. There's what we can measure with our signal processing tools that we all know how to build in this room. And then there's the control space. And a large part of being an electrical engineer is understanding this stuff. And then if you're an electrical engineer who also codes, you might end up building the thing up on top. And of course, you spend a lot of time learning to understand the measurable space and then figuring out some sort of control space to modify things. And so, you might have a worldview which is more like this. Your conceptual space is very closely matched to the control space because, heck, you built the thing. If anyone knows how to use it, you do. But for the users, 
there's this really big line between what they can perceive, what they can talk about, what these measurements mean, I don't understand what that graph is about, and what the knobs do. I turn this knob and it doesn't do anything. I turn that knob, it does a lot. I turn that knob and this knob and, you know, crazy things might happen, you know, as, as we say in, in academia, nonlinearities occur. I love that term, nonlinearities. If you want to sound intellectual, you say things like, well, this introduces nonlinearities, which if you think about it, is almost like saying nothing. <laughs> you know, you, okay, great, it's not linear, but that leaves the space of everything else. <laughs> Anyhow, so crossing this line requires experience, effort, and work. Now, if you are a musician who cares a lot about sound, you have spent 15 years learning how to do this, this mapping between the controls, conceptual and perceptual space on the saxophone or the guitar or the violin. And there is a limit to the amount of work that you can do like this because there's just, you know, we're all mortal and we all sleep and eat and have lives. And so there's some choice that the user has to make. Are they going to become expert in the tools? Now you might say, well, I didn't have a problem, but not everyone has the same mindset as you. And different kinds of people gravitate towards different things. You can see this. Uh, well, here, here's a great example. How many people here, I'm just going to see if, what we get in the way of. Raise your hands if you've ever used an Xbox. OK. Now, for those of you who haven't used an Xbox, raise your hand if you've played on a Wii. Few of you, okay. When the Wii came out, it was underpowered. The graphics were, were childlike, blah, 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 all the things they said about it. The fact of the matter was, it couldn't play, you couldn't play Halo on a Wii because it just didn't have the power needed to show realistic splatterings of blood like, you know, PlayStation and, and Xbox could. But the people who made the Wii realized there was an, a whole other population of users who might really want to play video games, perhaps not these exact video games, maybe something involving tennis, um, and that if they made the controllers easy and the games fun, it would draw in a completely different population. And in fact, the Wii was extremely successful for that reason. They didn't go after the same population. Let me talk a little bit more about bridging that gap. So here's a long time musician on learning to produce. I've been playing guitar for 30 years. I bought the recording interface, software, et cetera, six months ago. There is so much to learn at the same time. I don't know all of the terminology. I've given up for now, sad, because I've got a lot of ideas. Here's another one when I'm trying to program a synth. I give up. It's as if you put me in the control room of an airplane and I can't even take off. Which kind of makes sense if you've ever seen the control room of an airplane. It does look like a rack of effects and whatnot. So what I want to do is this. So let me back up. Here's where we are right now with the users and the controls. Here's how things are for the tool builder. The control space and the conceptual space are very aligned, but they're aligned because the tool builders, the kind of people that are in this room, took the time to learn you know, what a Fourier transform is, etc. But what if this happened? What if the control space looked more like the non-technical people's conceptual space? Could we make such a thing happen? And this comes to my basic design philosophy. I would like the user to remain in control of the process. I don't want the user to have to learn the control space. I want the tool to learn the user's conceptual space. So this is a slightly different take on intelligent music production in the sense that I'm not trying to automate a thing. I'm trying to change how we control the thing. Now, when we do this, obviously, there's going to be benefits and drawbacks. 
The fine, fine grained control that you might get from running a parametric equalizer directly in that low level parameter space may go away, but you might still be able to get at what you want as opposed to getting lost in the process. And I also want to say that I would love there to be a continuum. I would love there to be, hey, I don't even want to think about this step. Can someone give me an automatic master or an automatic mixer? I would love there to be a, well, I do want to think about this step, but I don't have the time to learn the details of the tools. Can I communicate with the tools in a way that's closer to the way I think about things? And then for the person who really wants to dig into it, we have the existing tool set. So then the question obviously becomes, if I want to make my machines talk in the language that people use, what language do people use? Well, since we're in England, I guess English is the, is the answer to that question. But somewhat more specifically, how do we communicate concepts? And there's a composer named Mark Applebaum who wrote a composition about composition called Precomposition. And I just want to play you a little bit of it, if I can find my mouse. Let's get back to this. Okay, you get the idea. And the thing I love about this composition is I think we've all probably had this conversation, right, at some point. What were we doing? We were giving evaluative feedback. Oh, yeah, I like that. Natural language terms. It could get distorted or staticky. Notice I'm not talking about, you know, spectral spread or flux or anything like that, I, you would use, you would probably, or even you, experts, would probably jump to words like staticky or fat, or it's a little tinny. And of course, examples. This is how we talk to each other about sounds. This is how, if you were a musician trying to talk to a, a, um, producer that you were paying a hundred pounds an hour. This is how you would talk to them. Only if you were some sort of amazing golden ears person would you be saying, oh yes, I've listened to that. And instead of going, it sounds really wet, you would say, oh, there's the, the balance between the reverb and the dry signal is exactly this. And I can tell that the time to first echo is that and that, oh, you know what? In fact, why don't we use the impulse response off of this thing that I got at the concert gabal the other day? Because it has, you know, <laughs> you probably don't talk that way, even you. So then the obvious thing for me, once I've got this philosophy in mind, is let's build tools that use natural language, examples, and evaluation so that people can do their thing. And now is that clock right, or are we at about 10.25? Yeah, okay. Okay, so one of the first things we did was something called IQ, which is an evaluative interface. And the basic idea is one similar to the idea behind eyeglasses. So I'm going to pick someone random in the audience. You there. Yeah, what's your prescription? What is your prescription for your eyeglasses? That's nice. You're pretty good. Very few people can do that when I just randomly pick someone in the audience. I'm like, what's your prescription? Now, when you walked in to request your glasses, did you know that going in? Not really. I was approximately 2.75 in the previous one. Okay, but this is good. This is good. And how did you determine what the right prescription would be this time? Practically, measuring, and seeing 
Right. So somebody, probably the optometrist, put a different prescription in front of you and asked you the, the, the question, is this better or worse? And then you responded, better or worse. Experimentally. Yeah. Experimentally. So. This is a website version of the stuff in IQ that became called Social EQ. Uh, so I'm going to teach it a word, and we're going to get an EQ effect. And I hope this works because I'm good. connecting back to a server in the United States right now. And so the game is this. I have a little hockey puck here. And I taught it, I'm going to teach it dark. So on this side, it now says dark, not at all dark, very dark. And when I click on a hockey puck, I'm going to hear a sound. the IQ version I didn't show you, actually required you to answer 25 questions like that, which turned out to be still faster for a non-expert to use because all they had to do was say yes or no, I like it or I don't like it. But not understanding what they would, you know, how do I put this? The novice user who has not been presented with the 21 knob uh, parametric equalizer finds answering 25 questions tiresome. So we had to figure out a way to speed it up. And the way we sped it up was we asked hundreds of other people about 25, 30 questions. And then once we had a huge database of existing answers to how much people liked or disliked certain EQ curves, now what we do when we run the process is we're really placing you in the space of prior users. And I'm answering a much smaller set of questions to say, so that it can quickly go, oh, you're, more, you're mostly like these people. And once we put you there, then we can quickly hand you some kind of EQ. And depending on whether you're on the website version, which doesn't let you actually control it, or you're on the IQ plugin, which then you can start to play with the EQ. Um, we put you in this space and then let you tweak. But this is a very different paradigm than directly controlling, and it's one that's very related to your eyeglasses. You just tell me how much you like or don't like, or how much you think this embodies the concept you're going for or doesn't, and it takes care of figuring out what else is going on. Now, I said I, I was teaching it a word, and in fact, every time I do this, it teaches something to a central server, and then this becomes more data that we use. And we decided that perhaps the way to go was to use our words rather than just use uh, like and don't like. This is, you know, so that my, my tools have been going through the same process that like, like a small child goes through, right? First you hand him something to eat and he's like, ah, or mm. And then eventually you start to say things like, use your words. Okay, not many of you have been through this process of <laughs> teaching someone to use their words, but we decided that maybe we could buy, buy so we, we started with asking 25 questions, then we got it down to eight questions, then we were like, why are we even asking these questions? If I walked in saying, 
I want it to be darker. Why don't we first hand you what other people have said darker is and see if that mostly solves your problem right there. But to do that, we have to know what, what other people have said before and how that maps onto something. So we decided to build vocabulary with crowdsourcing. Now we've done this for compression, for equalization, for reverb. Um, we play you a sound. This is the, I won't go through the process with you now, but basically we play you a dry sound. You then have the effect turned on. Then we ask you, hey, if you could use one or two words to describe what that effect is, what that change was, could you just type them here? And you do this to 100 people, to 1,000 people, to as many people as you can get. And eventually, you can build up a vocabulary. So here we've built up a vocabulary of, of reverb words, and these are some descriptors, chaotic, underwater, watery, boomy, distorted, messy, haunting. Some of these words turn out to have fairly high variance. What you're looking at here is we did some multidimensional scaling and put this into a 2D space so you could look at a map. Basically, our reverb control parameter space for this reverberator was five dimensions. And every time you see a word and it's big, that means a particular point in the space had multiple people. And the bigger it gets, the more people used that word to describe that particular reverb effect. And so you can see warm has a few high probability candidates and then kind of a spread distribution of other ones. <coughs> Underwater turned out to have really, really tight distribu a tight distribution. And so interestingly, and I think this one's fun, underwater is a word that we all know can't possibly apply in the way that I'm going to show you, because just logic. Um, yet, there is a broad agreement of what underwater is supposed to sound like in the public. And in fact, there was, uh, any of you guys know who Liz Fair is by any chance? Okay. Us old dudes <laughs> know who Liz Fair is. She was, uh, she was big in the 90s. And a friend of mine was actually bass player for Liz Fair, and he was telling me about a situation that she was in. She's a really good musician, plays the electric guitar. She was saying to her engineer uh, on the road, I want it to sound underwater. And the engineer said, well, if you dropped your guitar underwater, I'm not sure that's the sound you're looking for. And they had this whole back and forth um, when really what she should have done was used our software. So we went ahead and Here's the online version. So now you've seen two paradigms. You've seen this evaluative control. It keeps presenting you options, and you just tell it how much you like those options. And it's in the background trying to figure out, based on your likes and dislikes, trying to hone in on your option just the same way that your glasses prescription got done. Now here's an alternate interface where we've talked to a lot of people before getting to you, and we think we know what you mean when you use certain words. So 
hey, why don't you just tell us what you're looking for? Now there's one other one that I'd like to talk about. Oh, oh, and here's an interesting thing. What we did, let me back up and just say this. We actually decided to um, do two different audio production tasks and see whether or not the word interface was doing a good job. So evoking a concept turned out to be, you know, dead simple. People, if we told them to evoke a concept like underwater, obviously they looked at the, the word cloud, they clicked on underwater and they got it and they told us they got it. That wasn't the interesting one. The interesting one is achieve a desired sound because now you would normally expect that a word cloud kind of interface would not be as precise or as accurate as one where you had, say, a graphic equalizer or a parametric EQ to exactly set the sound. So what we did was we, uh, we would play a sound for people, the dry sound, then we would add an effect. And we would say, okay, here's the job. We're going to hand you the effects tool that was used to make that effect on that sound. All you have to do is match effect, okay? And then we'd, we did this repeatedly with people and we would just alternate A or B, whether they got the word cloud interface or in, this, in, in the case of uh, EQ, a 40 band graphic equalizer, go. And the short story is for both reverberation and for EQ on a performance measure that measured how closely the signal actually matched the resulting output. Um, blue is our interface. The traditional interface is green. 108 people who are not expert engineers, just people who are interested in sound. They never did worse using our interface. With EQ, in fact, they always did better. Not always, but you see the distributions here. Higher is better. People were actually better off with a word cloud interface than they were with directly controlling the parameters. Now, both of our interfaces, when you click around on the word cloud, you can also see how the EQs and the reverbs are being set. So if you prefer to use the other interface, it's there for you. But I just want to point out to you that not everyone is going to think like you and that there are different levels of control that people want to have. A little bit of commentary on this. I love the word interface. It matches the way my brain works. I hate the traditional EQ. This one makes sense for me. I know the signal parameter, the EQ, allows fine tuning, and it's probably better for someone experienced. But since I'm not, I found the word interface much easier to work with. I'm going to mention one last thing. We're not going to go in depth because I know that I'm supposed to stop talking in five minutes. And in fact, I'll stop talking sooner than that. And I'm going to let my almost done uh, doctoral student, Mark Cartwright, talk about the third thing, which is what happens when you combine examples and evaluative interface for, in this case, controlling a synthesizer. Synthesis is an audio production tool that allows users to interact with synthesizers in a more natural way. Instead of navigating the synthesis space using knobs and sliders that control difficult to understand synthesis parameters, Users can search using examples, like existing recordings or vocal imitations. They then listen and rate the machine's suggestions to give feedback during the interactive search process. Let's see an example using a synthesizer database with 10,000 randomly generated sounds. So Mark records it. Says how close he thinks he got to his idealized sound that was in his head. Now the tool is taking different dimensions that it's measured and handing back things that it thought was closest along what it thought was the important set of dimensions. It may have been significant. And the game is, 
you move it closer to the center of the target. If you think it sounds like it's doing well, you click to remove it if it's a complete miss. And it helps the machine home. What you see over here is the set of actual parameters that control the synth that normally you would have a knob for each one of these. And he's programmed the synth. Synthesis yeah. is an audio product. So we did an experiment, and I'll end with this. This is, the, this is the interface to that synthesizer, the normal traditional one. And basically we played the same game, duplicate the sound. We made the sound with this interface, randomly spin the knobs, hand it to you, and say, match the sound. Or use the synthesis algorithm. Um, and here we have 16 different users. This is, over time, um, this is actually self-evaluated. The users were saying how close they thought they were getting to the sound in this case. Um, and as with the previous example, they were better off with examples, evaluative feedback, than they were actually directly controlling the parameters. So I'll wrap up with this. My basic design philosophy, I would like to keep the user in control. I don't want them to learn the control space. I want the tool to learn the user's conceptual space. And so this puts me in sort of an intermediary position compared to some of you who are about full automation and some others who might object to automation entirely. And I think we can all play well together. And in my ideal world, what happens is you walk into the studio to do your thing and, and the tool says to you, which parts do you want me to take care of? Which parts do you want to have a discussion with me about? And which parts do you feel really invested in and you're going to dig in? And then, so maybe I feel really invested in microphone selection, so I don't have an automatic microphone selector. I pick the mics. But then I want a rough mix generated for me by existing technology that some people in this room have made. And then I say to myself, the rough mix is good, but I don't like my sound. I want to be a little darker or a little warmer on the clarinet. Can we have a talk about that? And that process happens, and I get the level of control I'm interested in. I get to focus on things that I care about without having to necessarily get the skills of mapping from controls to conceptual space or perceptual space that uh, someone who's dedicated their life to being an engineer has done. Okay, that's the talk. If you're curious to find out more about what we do, that's the website. And so thank you very much.